those of you who joined me uh, last week, welcome back. Thank you for again, taking the time out of your day to spend an hour with me. For those of you who are just joining me today, welcome. This webinar is part of a three-part series. Uh, last week, we talked a lot about the interplay between our emotions, our physical self, and our health. Uh, we discussed uh, the benefits of mind-body work in our healthcare and, and how to kind of incorporate those. Um, that uh, webinar from last week will be available on our YouTube. Uh, you can find us at American Liver on YouTube. Today, we're going to look at how to manage our physical and mental selves to better cope with liver disease. Um, and then next week, the, the final part of the series on December 7th, um, I ask that you consider joining me to learn some actual tools and techniques that we can incorporate into everyday life. Um, speaking from experience, I know that living with liver disease can be hard. Um, I was actually diagnosed with hepatitis C at 10 years old uh, and was successfully cured at about 21 years old, um, but was almost into cirrhosis by that point. Um, I know it can be a struggle to find a specialist who not only understands your diagnosis, but one who you actually connect with as well. It can be a struggle to face the all too often and frequent social stigma that can accompany liver disease. Uh, many feel they uh, need to explain away their illness. Um, it can be a struggle to help caregivers understand your journey and your experience. It can be a struggle to be a caregiver. Uh, it can be hard to face the fatigue, the sleep disturbances, the itchiness, the confusion, the nausea, the physical discomfort. Um, it can just be a struggle to endure all the ways that liver disease impacts and influences your life. But it's so important to remember that you are more than your diagnosis of liver disease. It's important to learn how to live with and alongside your liver disease. Um, uh, yeah, uh, you're not going to see me. I'm just going to have audio today. Um, I, I got a question today saying that they could not see the presenter. Um, I'm just going to stay off camera today so you can focus on being present with yourselves. Um, so as I was saying, it's, it's important to remember uh, you are far more than that diagnosis of liver disease. It's important to live how to live with it and alongside it, um, to recognize the hardships and struggles and, and give validation and voice to those things, but to avoid kind of falling into to focusing on only that. Um, in today's program, you may see a couple slides from last week's if you were with us. I will revisit a couple little concepts because again, these are kind of all intertwined. Um, I do want to start by watching a short video about how mindfulness can empower us. Um, if you are watching this as a recording after this live webinar, please know that the video won't play, um, but you can access it in the link in the description of this video. Um, so with that, I'm going to share this video with you. So I think it's really important to remember that you know we do have these powers um, we have the ability to choose um, how what we what we focus on and where we put our energies and our attentions and i think especially with liver disease it's so important to remember that you know sometimes energy can be a limited resource and a finite um a finite one and you have to choose kind of how to spend it um, my hope is that through these workshops, you can walk away with a few skills to become more aware um, and utilize your influence in your, the areas that you can. Um, I ask you to approach today without judgment um, because mindfulness is truly bringing your attention to your experiences in the present moment, your thoughts, your feelings, your bodily sensations, and recognizing them without judgment and with total acceptance. Say you have a cramp in your foot right now. Mindfulness asks us to not force that away, to ask it to change or, or be anything other than that cramp. It's about recognizing and, and being aware of those things. Mindfulness can help us develop empathy for ourselves as well as for other people. Um, as, as we kind of covered last week, there's this huge growing body of research that binds 
Mindfulness training can lead to reduced stress, improvements in mood, health, self-efficacy, self-compassion. Um, they've also seen um, actual physical, biological markers and changes happening when people start to incorporate mindfulness. Um, seeing changes in hormone levels and, and blood pressure, um, having noted improvement in a lot of those areas. So when it comes to being mindful and, and thinking about ourselves as, as people who have liver disease, um, I think it's really important to think about what self-care and self-management means if you have a chronic disease. Um, in this triangle, um, you'll kind of see there's, there's two separate triangles, right? So if we're living with a long-term chronic condition, most of our care falls to us. It falls to ourselves to take care of ourselves. Um, you know, you go to the doctor maybe once a year, once every other year. Um, it's not until you start to really advance and progress, or if you have much higher risks um, as somebody with, living with a certain liver disease, that the ratio of, of how much self-care versus professional care is going to swing the other way. Um, the more advanced our liver disease gets, you're going to start seeing a lot more um, health professionals, much more of your care is going to be either in that professional realm or split more 50-50. Um, but, you know, it is, it is the bulk of people, 70 to 80 percent of people with long-term conditions who are spending most of their time here, where they're caring for themselves. Um, they are going to their doctor again, maybe once a year, a couple times a year, um, but most of the burden is falling on you. Um, I think that this is a very fitting quote from the journal, um, uh, uh, if physicians view themselves as experts whose job it is to get patients to behave in ways that reflect that expertise, both will continue to be frustrated. Once physicians recognize patients as experts on their own lives, they can add their medical expertise to what patients know about themselves to create a plan that will help patients achieve their goal. It's really important to remember that we know ourselves better than any doctor ever can really. Um, you know, there's so much that can be gained from looking at a blood test, looking at an imaging test, but it's us who lives in our body all day, every day. Um, it is us who knows what medications and, and medical interventions will work in our lives and, and that we will be able to take part in. Um, it's us who knows what those side effects of those medications are or what the symptoms and the burden on your quality of life um, of liver disease and how that affects you. So it's really important to remember that you are a huge part of your own care team. Um, you should feel confident to advocate for yourself. Um, whether it's in the doctor's office or at home, um, whether it's you know when it comes to symptom management or if it comes to you know how you're going to spend your time. Um, I have a couple of videos I want to share today. Uh, it's really just this next one and then one more on exercise. Um, but this next short video I want to share with you, um, I think it's it's a great way to start to think about how to organize what our priorities are. Um, again, if you're watching this. Uh, as a recording this webinar, uh, the video will not play, but you can access the link in the description below. So I now want to talk a little bit about this concept. We all have different rocks, different pebbles, different sand, but we can all approach our stuff in this way. Think about what your rocks are, what your pebbles are, What's your sand? Think about what things you're currently putting in your jar first. And ask yourself if you're leaving room for anything, everything else. Are you currently successful in the way that you're managing yourself? Sometimes it's hard to know what sort of power we can exact. What is our ability to self-manage? What's in our control and what isn't? How should we invest our energies? Is it helping us, hurting us? Today is more about more than mindfulness and meditation. It's about identifying that which we can control and that which we can't, but all the while accepting our current state without judgment. So healthcare truly begins with self-care. When you're on an airplane and there's an emergency, 
what instructions do you receive? You're told, you know, if we start going down and these masks fall from the ceiling, you're told to put on your own mask first before helping anybody else. And life is truly like that. You have to care for yourself so you can care for everyone else around you. And this means looking after you, the big stuff, the small stuff, the in-between stuff, it can all make an enormous difference in our daily quality of life. All we ask is that you look after you as best as you can, one decision at a time. Self-care can feel like indulgence. Um, as, as this Audre Lorde set quote says, self-care is not about self-indulgence, it's about self-preservation. According to a 2017 article in the Journal of Counseling Psychology titled The Development of Self-Care Assessment for Psychologists, uh, they define what self-care is. Uh, they define self-care as a multidimensional, multifaceted process of purposeful engagement in strategies that promote healthy functioning and enhance well-being. Uh, Self-care is really not a one-size-fits-all uh, idea. Everyone's self-care plan needs to be customized to really what fits their needs. Um, it's important to look at what areas we can exert change in, where we can self-manage to empower ourselves um, and uh, enhance our well-being. Um, it's important to look uh, at the areas of our life that need some more attention and determine how we will practice self-care based on that outcome. It's important to reassess often as our situation changes, our self-care needs are likely to change. But really, so what's involved in self-care? What is this multifaceted process? Um, I just wanna leave you before we go on to the next uh, thoughts on, on how to self-manage, this quote uh, from Eleanor Brown, rest and self-care are so important. When you take time to replenish your spirit, it allows you to serve others from the overflow. You cannot serve from an empty vessel. Some of you may be caregivers yourself. Some of you may be uh, mothers, aunts, uncles, fathers, um, sisters, brothers, cousins. Um, we can't take care of anybody else if we don't take care of us first. Um, it can be hard to prioritize ourselves, but again, when energy is kind of that finite resource, we need to make sure that we're expending it truly on those big important things first before the other things. So today I wanna to talk about some self types of self-management. Um, self-management are the methods, skills, and strategies that we can use to improve our self-care um, by managing our bodies, our thoughts, our feelings, and behaviors, um, to better achieve our goals. By identifying and understanding the dimensions of different types of self-management, we can determine where we have control and what we can change or improve. Um, it's all about finding out where we have that ability to impact change and doing something about it. Um, because truly, um, if, if we're just trying to do the next best thing, uh, we, can, we can get distracted. So it's really important to look at your life, um, your physical self, your psychological self, and where you have room for improvement and, and how you might improve. Um, so I wanna start by looking at our physical self. Our body is this finely tuned machine. It has so many different functions that just happen automatically. Our lungs breathe, our heart pumps, our guts digest. Um, and these things just are. We really can't do anything other than stay out of the way and do our best to give that machine the best possible conditions to do its tasks. Um, our body is capable of self-management on autopilot, uh, but we do have influence on how our body impacts our emotions. When we care for our bodies, we think and feel better. All the stress relief tips and tricks in the world won't help if you aren't taking care of your physical self. Um, I'd like to read a, a short passage called Mindfulness of the Body. Um, this is from Titnit Han. In our body, there may be tension and pain. If we suppress or ignore this, then every day the tension and pain will grow and prevent us from experiencing the happiness that we should be able to experience. When we have tension in our body, we can't sleep well or eat well. Mindfulness of breathing can help us relax and bring peace to our body. 
we take care of our body first, we can take care of our mind later. So I want to talk a little bit about sleep, exercise, and nutrition, and, and these different uh, ideas, uh, kind of pieces, facets of that physical self-management. So sleep. Sleep is huge. Sleep helps us deal with crisis, illness, stress, anxiety. Uh, it improves our concentration. It can help fatigue. It, it can improve our decision making and our creativity. Um, what, when we sleep, um, our, our crisis hormone, our cortisol levels decline. Um, our brain begins to process information. We're not really sure why we dream, um, but it's pretty believed that uh, many theorists that one reason for dreaming is it's a coping mechanism and provides us a safe place to process distressing emotions and make connections with events that have occurred throughout the day. When we sleep, our immune system is boosted and cell repair can happen. Um, we can, you know, I don't know if you've ever heard the old adage, you got to rest to heal. Um, when, uh, when we sleep, we have the lowest levels of cortisol, again, that stress hormone in our system. Um, sleep deprivation can increase the levels of cortisol in our body, um, and increased levels of cortisol have been found um, in the bodies of teenagers who have only had five hours of sleep. So it is so important to get that sleep. Um, when we let our body and brain, um, when we give them the time it needs to, to really kind of recharge during sleep, we feel better physically and mentally. It makes it easier to cope with and address things that are worrying us and, and really helps to reduce that anxiety. Sleep can help us deal with all of this, but lack of sleep can cause all of this. Um, I know that some folks with liver disease can get on opposite sleep-wake cycles. Sometimes it's just impossible to wake up and sometimes it's impossible to go to sleep. Um, it's important to be kind to yourself if you're having trouble sleeping, try to set yourself up um, for the best possible sleep. Um, I know it sounds silly, but setting a bedtime can be huge. Um, there are things on your phone or on your, your computer that you can do to reduce blue light. Um, blue light is this certain type of light that can actually stimulate your brain a little bit more. Um, you can put on a blue light filter on your um, a uh, laptop computer, there's a lot of settings for that. You can put one on your phone to reduce the amount of blue light. That can help you fall asleep. Um, cutting out screen time a little bit before bed can be huge. Um, it's so important to, you know, when you're sick, when you're stressed, you are going to have a harder time sleeping. Um, but if you can set yourself up um, for the best possible chances of getting a good night's sleep, um, you're going to be better off. Uh, when we're more well rested, we're less likely to overreact to our emotional triggers. Um, we're less vulnerable to stress. It's really this vicious cycle. Um, so try to set yourself a bedtime. Um, I know I have a, a reminder on my phone that lets me know when it's time that I should be thinking about going to bed, whether I listen to it or not. That's one thing, but I have it. Um, trying to, you know, get, do yourself the kindness of a nice clean bed and a made bed. Um, you know, if you had a guest over and they were staying the night and they didn't feel well, would you just, you know, throw them into a, a messy room with an unkempt bed or would you give them a nice clean place to rest and relax, a, a nice bed to fall into? Um, try to treat yourself a little bit kinder. Um, treat yourself the way that you might a friend. Um, you might be surprised how much better off your friends are than, than you are. Um, so another big part of physical self-management is uh, consistent exercise. Uh, consistent exercise has been linked to increased productivity and mental focus. Um, exercise can help us be more present with our families, ourselves, our day-to-day, -day, work, school, families. But have you ever made a bold resolution like, I'm going to start going to the gym every single day and then not carry through on it? That makes you feel even worse. You end up feeling guilty, blaming yourself. Um, removing that self-inflicted guilt is a really good form of self-care. Sometimes self-care means not going to the gym. Um, if we truly need rest and relaxation, then don't go to the gym. Uh, but the benefits of exercise are really incredible. Um, again, this will be the final video in today's webinar. Um, 
just a final reminder, if you are watching this as a recording, you, uh, the video won't play, but you can access it in the link uh, in the description of this video. So um, I wanna watch this short video on the wonderful benefits of exercise and then talk a little bit more about how we can incorporate um, some exercise into our day-to-day. -day. So, you know, I really like this concept that exercise does not need to be going to the gym, that, that walking um, can, can truly be one of the best uh, forms of intervention for you and your health and your life. Um, I, it's interesting, I actually worked on the nurse's health study that's uh, mentioned there. Um, and some of the forms of exercise that were discussed were not just walking, um, things like, dancing and singing, swimming, uh, doing sports, running around with your kids, your grandkids or your dog, um, going out shopping with a friend, uh, doing housework or gardening. Um, you know, I love to garden and I can tell you, I do probably about 20 squats when I'm doing my weeding in just one little area. Um, laughter, I mean, have you ever had one of those big deep belly laughs where your abs hurt? Um, that's, that's exercise. Um, rigorous sex can be exercise. Um, exercise can help in any number of ways. Um, it's really important to talk to your doctor about what's gonna be best for you, um, but exercise can release endorphins, help reduce stress, manage our depression, uh, reduce stress hormones, improve our sleep, um, improve our energy. Um, I hate going to the gym, I really do. I have signed up for so many gyms through the years and um, can sometimes even just get caught up with the social anxiety of navigating the, the locker room or kind of figuring out the social cues of that gym. Um, I got a dog a couple years ago, as I said, and exercising with him has been so much fun. I mean, it's running around in the backyard or it's going on a hike, um, but change the way you think about exercise um, and also know when exercise is going to be a form of self-care. Um, and when resting and relaxing is going to be a better form of self-care. Um, all right, so food, nutrition. I talked about this a little bit last week, um, but remember that food is food. Food is not good or bad. Food is not the enemy or something to be controlled. Um, remember to approach food without judgment. Um, the food we eat impacts our ability to thrive. Think about healthy nutrition as an investment in a healthier you. What, when, and how you eat determines how you're going to show up for life. Allow food to be a form of self-care. Again, think about when you have a guest over, right? You're not going to put a, a microwave TV dinner out for them um, in front of the TV. Um, how we eat, uh, where we eat, with whom determines our nutrition and healthy eating, eating habits just as much as what we physically eat. Um, the environment you set up for yourself is huge. Uh, when we sit down to eat in front of a computer or a TV, we tend to eat mindlessly. Finishing the meal without any kind of thought, any sort of intention, you may not even taste the food you're eating. If we can create an environment for ourselves free of distraction, we can promote a more peaceful, mindful meal enjoyment. Um, by doing so, kind of setting yourself up for that, that nice sit down meal, uh, focusing on your food hygiene, if you will, you may linger a little bit longer over your meal. You may actually enjoy it. Uh, you may avoid overeating because you may be more in tune with your satiety cue, uh, cues your body letting you know that you're full rather than just continuing to eat because it's there. You'll digest better. Um, at the very least, you know, taking a breath, sitting down, chewing your food. Um, don't stand in the kitchen grazing on a plate. Um, be mindful, even when you're eating. Uh, taste every bite, you know, feel how it feels in your mouth, in your hands. Um, be present for your meals. Remember balance. <laughs> uh there's no remember i cannot uh, you know it's, it's very very important to talk to your doctor about your dietary needs um but really there's no good and bad only food um balance on our plate can really help to bring balance in our lives some food boosts energy others help with our sleep others can improve our mood um different foods do different jobs in our body and we need all of it 
Uh, there's no one food by itself that's healthy, and there's no one food by itself that's un that is solidly unhealthy. Um, be mindful of the foods on your plate, um, but but you know, make sure that you're not avoiding ever indulging. Um, you can reduce your cravings and be more fulfilled if you are intentional intentional about the foods that you eat. Um, next time you have dinner, say tonight, um, sit down in a nice quiet place, enjoy your meal, focus on the bites that you're taking, um, and then be nice to yourself and have some dessert. Um, but don't eat 10 cookies while standing up in the kitchen. Sit down with even just one small Hershey's kiss or something like that and let it slowly melt in your mouth. Um, try to be present for your food to taste it. Um, but remember, when it comes to timing for nutrition, you know, some people are all about five meals or no eating before noon. Eat when you're hungry. Eating shouldn't just be an item on your to-do list. Enjoy the process of cooking. Put yourself first by providing yourself a balanced, nourishing meal. Honor your hunger and respect yourself by feeding your body what it needs to be fed. Make time for a meal. Don't skip lunch just because you have too much on your figurative plate. What we eat, how we eat, and when we eat all influence our overall health, both physical and emotional. Our nutritional choices don't exist independent of our life factors, but it's all interconnected. What we eat impacts how we feel, which impacts what we do. Um, I can tell you on Thanksgiving, I did not feel great <laughs> and immediately went to sleep. How we feel impacts what we eat, uh, which impacts what we do. And what we do impacts how we feel, which impacts what we eat. It's a cycle, it's all a loop. Um, and, but we have choice and we can interject change into that loop. Our body and the care that we invest influences our mind. That's what this whole mind-body connection is all about. Really taking care of the body while also taking care of your mind. Um, so we've talked a little bit about physical self-management. Um, and, and you may recognize the slide if you were with me last night, last week, um, but you know, it's, it's really this idea of how we think and how we feel impacts what we do. The mind-body connection means that our thoughts, our feelings, our beliefs, and our attitudes can positively and negatively uh, affect our biological functioning. Our minds can affect how healthy our bodies are. Um, what we do with our physical body, what we eat, how much we exercise, even our physical posture can impact our mental health, um, positively or negatively. Um, you know, if you walk around with your shoulders square and your chin up, you're going to feel more confident than if you're walking around with slumped shoulders and a, a tucked head. There's this real complex interrelationship between our minds and our bodies. Um, <clears throat> our whole body shares this common chemical language of hormones and um, you know our immune system, our endocrine system, all of our body, all of our emotional responses are all sharing this chemical language and constantly communicating with one another. It's really important to know that these mental states can be fully conscious or unconscious um, and that we can have emotional reactions um, without even really being aware of why we're reacting. Um, every mental state has a physiological one associated with it. Um, positive and negative impacts on the body. Um, for example, something, anxiety, the mental state of anxiety causes you to produce stress hormones. Um, you have the ability to change that chemical language that's happening. Um, and many mind-body therapies focus on becoming more conscious of our mental states and using that increased awareness to guide the mental state to a better, less destructive place. So just remember how we think and how we feel impacts what we do. So I wanna spend um, you know, a little bit of time before we close up um, talking about uh, how to self-manage our, our minds. Our thoughts, our emotions, and our behaviors are intrinsically connected to one another. Um, I really wanna examine these facets of self-management at one time. Um, so managing our thoughts or our psychological self-care. If something we think is bad, is about to happen, or has just happened, we will likely experience fear or anger. If something good is about to happen or has just happened, we're likely going to experience joy or satisfaction. 
Our emotions are stirred from our belief, simply a belief about something. How we think about something influences how we feel about it. Managing our thoughts is a matter of managing both the quantity and the quality of your thoughts. When our minds are constantly running, constant nonstop overthinking, we tend to experience negative emotions or mindsets, anxiety, confusion, lack of focus or stress. These emotions can impact our sleep, create muscle tension, um, you know, that, that true mind-body link. Management of our thoughts is also about making sure what we think is accurate or true um, versus an assumption or a distortion. Um, being more mindful of our thoughts, whether through a physical log or daily practice, brings consciousness to our thoughts. Analyze the validity of your thoughts by looking at evidence that refutes or supports those thoughts or beliefs, and then either discard it or replace it, um, depending on what needs to happen. A lot of times we can get stuck in kind of our, our same old thinking, um, again, in a cycle, a, a vicious cycle. So making sure um, that you, uh, you know, are, are making sure that you're analyzing the thoughts that you have, um, making sure they're valid before acting upon them. So managing our emotions, um, emotional self-care, uh, the best way to manage our feelings um, is to manage the thoughts that trigger those feelings. So again, that psychological self-care. Once an emotion is triggered, particularly a powerful one like jealousy, uh, it can be anger or fear. They can shape our behavior in ways um, that can be really hard to control. It can be hard to stop um, or predict a behavior when we have those strong emotional responses. We can use different techniques to stop that emotionally laden behavior, things like deep breathing. Um, if you were with me last week, I showed you the um, uh, square breathing technique. Uh, relaxation and visualiz visualization, prayer. Um, many people use mantras, meditation, exercise. We can also avoid situations that are likely to trigger unpleasant or disturbing emotions um, while seeking out more situations that will trigger positive and pleasant ones. Um, I know for me right now, the best form of emotional self-management that I'm doing is avoiding the news. I get a little bit uh, by by written news, but I don't watch the news. Um, I'm avoiding that. I'm also watching a lot of reruns on streaming platforms because I know the ending and it's helping me to feel secure. Um, sometimes managing our emotions can be simple like that. Um, and sometimes it can be a little bit deeper dive. And then managing our behaviors, our behavioral self-care. All of our behaviors are done for a reason even if we're not aware of that reason. There's always intention or purpose behind an act. It's essential for us to determine the motivation or intention behind our actions in order for us to elicit any sort of change to that behavior. If we don't understand why we're behaving the way that we're behaving, we cannot make a change. At the very least, we should do this for behaviors that are counterproductive or harmful. To manage our behavior, we really have to understand our thoughts and feelings that prompt that behavior, and willpower is needed. We have to want to change a behavior and dedicate the attention and effort needed to make that change a reality. How we think and how we feel impacts what we do. So today, you know, I talked a lot about the concepts of self-management, but I know we didn't get too much into the tools and techniques. Um, I really want to spend next week's webinar in those actual tools and techniques. Um, I want to share with you different meditations, um, some visualization techniques, some um, progressive muscle relaxation things, um, stuff that we can do kind of in the day to day, in the moment to, to take a beat outside of that emotional brain and think about why we're behaving the way that we're behaving. So, while mindfulness is paying attention to something in a particular way, on purpose, in the moment, without judgment, it's also about perception and reaction. Mindfulness can be a way to gain control over your reactions and perceptions of reality. What you think or perceive, you then become or behave. 
Rather than giving in to hopelessness and despair, find the hope or the good that others may not readily see. Remember that we all have ownership over our perceptions and our reactions, our behaviors and our thoughts. If you think you always get a raw deal in life, then you're probably right. Not because life is out to get you, but because you perceive it to be. Even if something good comes along, you're gonna be waiting for the off, next awful thing to happen. Rather than appreciating the good right in front of you, you're busy waiting for the other shoe to drop. Living mindfully, fully aware, fully present, and actively knowing that whatever your situation is, it's simply that, a situation. It doesn't define you unless you allow it to. Life is hard. It can be a struggle, but suffering is optional. Perceiving and reacting out of love and mindful awareness will decide which side of the bus you're sitting on. Um, at this point, I'd really like to open it up for any questions that any, or thoughts or, or feelings that anybody might have. Please feel free to share in the chat or as a question. Um, and please consider joining me for the third and final installment of this webinar series next week, uh, December 7th at 4 p.m. Um, again, during that program, we'll review tools and techniques that you can incorporate into your daily life um, to guide you on this journey of liver disease. Um, as I said, I lived with liver disease for a good long time. I cared for my mother um, before, during, and after her transplant. I know how important <clears throat> excuse me, self-care can and, and should be um, for patients and for caregivers, um, and how hard it can be to find that balance. Um, liver disease can disrupt a lot, um, but it's really important to, to take that and, and do something positive with it. Um, I, I'm always reminded when I talk about perception in these workshops um, of a personal story, uh, if you'll allow me. Um, my father died when I was young and uh, at the wake, uh, my mom's aunt came up to her, my great aunt and said, um, you know, I don't envy you a bit. You're in for a life of hell. Um, this woman had just lost her husband. She, she imagined my mother's life would be over because her husband was dead. And, you know, my mom thought, no, I'm not, you know, I got to put one foot in front of the other. Um, she was not going to succumb to the misery that surrounded her. Um, instead, she decided what, what emotions she would bring um, and what perception uh, she would have um, and which side of the bus she would sit on. Because I think all too often we can feel um, helpless to our situation, um, but it's really truly what we're doing with that situation that matters most. Um, if there are no questions, um, again, I'm more than happy to take any questions or thoughts or comments um, in, in the chat box or in the question box here. Um, but otherwise, I would love to really thank all of you for joining me today. Um, I hope that you found this program to be helpful um, to, to kind of provide you some, some stuff that you can bring into your life. Um, and, and most of all, know uh, that you're not alone as you work to cope with liver disease. Um, I didn't talk about my liver disease until I started doing stuff with the American Liver Foundation. And for me, it was like a breath of fresh air. Being able to see your story reflected in others um, truly has a, a unique power. Um, and knowing that so many others out there are coping with the same things that you are um, is, is important to remember. We're in this together, um, and I live or love you guys, and I hope that you'll join us next week on December 7th um, for the final installment of this. Um, oh, I just got a wonderful uh, uh, comment that uh, someone's friend says, pain is inevitable, misery is optional. That's very, very true, Carol. Thank you for that. Um, and yes, Susan, um, similarly, my mom's name is Susan, and she is a very strong woman. Um, you know, I think that we all have um, the ability to decide, um, you know, when we wake up in the morning, if we're going to wake up on the, the right side or the wrong side of the bed. Um, and sometimes there are issues with our livers and, and our body can feel like it has betrayed us. Um, but I think it's important to adjust your expectations of yourself, be kind to yourself, um, and treat yourself like that friend. Um, 
you know, be be nice to, to you. Um, with that, I will say I hope you have a wonderful evening wherever you are. Um, and I hope that you'll join me again on December 7th. Um, I, I hope that this was a helpful program and I look forward to seeing some of you again next week. Have a wonderful evening, everyone.